Again, as I mentioned, as we move forward into the, into the main message, for those of you who have not been here, we've been going through the book of Acts for several months now. And we've come up on the last part of Acts chapter 9. And we're gonna, I'm going to read over a few verses there and touch on a couple of highlights, but I felt uh, very moved to move forward into Acts chapter 10. Um, we finished up with how that after Paul's preaching in, in Acts chapter 9 uh, up to verse 31 that the churches uh, had rest throughout all Judea and, Gal uh, and Galilee and Samaria uh, and were edified and walking in the fear of uh, Yahweh and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit of the Ruach they were multiplied. And then we pick up in verse 32 all the way through verse 43 um, we get a shift of, of conversation talking about what happened with Peter which leads up to Acts chapter 10 that we're going to pick up on today. If you'll follow along with me, we're going to go through a few verses to finish up chapter 9. I'm going to touch a couple of highlight points there and move forward on into Acts chapter 10, in which I've titled something called the Gentile Prophecy. Um, we're going to talk about several things and cover some scriptures, and we're going to hit a few highlights talking about some of those passages of scriptures that we just heard read out loud earlier today. Um, if you would... Let's go, uh, if you will go with me to the Father in prayer that he would uh, anoint our time together in the, in the reading and the discussion of his word. Father, we thank you for the day. Father, we're not worthy. We have done such wrong in your eyes. We're not even worthy to have your word. But in your mercy... You loved us while we were yet sinners, and you sent Yeshua to die in our place. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for our failure. Help us, Father, to be your people. Help us to be ambassadors that represent you. Help us to be conformed to the image of Yeshua more every day. Father, as we break open your word, I pray that you would, uh, that you would open our minds, unlock our minds to understand that all things written were written concerning Yeshua and how they apply to Him and how they apply to us. Father, I pray that You would help us, give us spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear. Father, and most of all, give us a heart to receive it. Father, help us to lay down our traditions, our preconceptions. Help us just to learn from Your Word. Give us boldness to speak it. Give us strength to live it out. Father, we pray that you would give us clarity of mind today. Give me liberty of speech. And Father, forgive us where we fall short. We ask that you would pour your spirit out upon this place today. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Picking up in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 32, tells us, and it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, uh, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Yeshua HaMashiach, make thee whole, arise, make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda, and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. I remember as I talked remember as I talked about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle, how that everything that Yahweh does, he does with eternal dimension. He does it with a global scale. He didn't save Paul just to be saving Paul. He done it for the purpose of spreading the gospel that others might believe. And in the same way, anything he does, he does for his glory. In the same way, when he healed this man, we notice in verse 35, it says, All that dwelt at Lydda and Saron uh, saw him and turned to the Lord. And it says, And now there was at Joppa, or Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works 
and alms seeds, which she did. I'm going to take just a second there and talk about Tabitha, if you will. Um, in, we see this word used in the Hebrew, the word Tabitha, um, is actually, it roots, the Greek word roots from the Hebrew word 6646, Tabitha, which is also found in the, if I can find my place, I have my marker here. And some, depending on what translation you have, you're going to have the, uh, you're going to have song, it's going to say Songs of Solomon, it's going to say Song of Songs, um, but if you will look with me, let me get my page turned, and I'll tell you what page number it is, but it won't be on the same page as yours. If you look in either uh, whatever your translation calls it, whether it's Songs of Solomon or Song of Songs, <coughs> if you'll follow along with that, that phrase, Tabitha, which is by interpretation is called Dorcas. Dorcas comes from the Greek word 1393. Both of these words translate out Tabitha and Dorcas by interpretation, just helping you understand what this name means. And by interpretation, anybody know what the name Tabitha or Dorcas means? Off the top of your head, pop quiz. What's it mean? Gazelle. Gazelle. Good answer. That's right. It means gazelle, uh, as in the animal. Uh, we find that actually found all in, in the Songs of Solomon or Song of Songs in chapter, uh, I'm just going to give you one, it's uh, chapter 2, verse 9, actually, reads, um, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. That word roe there in the King James is actually the same word, Tabitha. Um, also, we see it in um, chapter 4, verse 5, which says, Thy two breasts are likened unto young roes. There are twins which feed among the lilies. That word rose there, of course, is dealing with the word Tabitha again, which means gazelle. Uh, it was not uncommon back in those days for a, it's very likely that Tabitha, or in, by interpretation Dorcas, which means gazelle also, uh, actually was probably a very beautiful woman. It wasn't, unlikely, it wasn't an unlikely thing that back in those days that they named women, uh, beautiful women, or they were referred to them after a, a beautiful animal. And everybody knows a gazelle or a deer is, uh, when, we, when we see an image of, of natural beauty, uh, we refer to, or we don't refer to a dog. We don't, we don't refer to, a, uh, to armadillo. We'll refer to something like a deer or something beautiful. When we refer to strength and courage, we refer to, just like Yeshua is referred to as the Lion of Judah, uh, strength. Uh, in the same way, Tabitha means gazelle. And it says, and it came to pass in those days, she was sick and died. To whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Just a real quick point I want to make about this. Is there's a, there are people out in this world that teach this health and wealth and this prosperity gospel. That if, if we just walk in the way and we just do, uh, do good, that all, the, all these sicknesses and whatever man wants to die. Read on. Their, their bodies are clean. He gave for a summons for him at that point. We don't healing and heal her from her sickness. Who knows? Maybe the uh, The reality is, it's in in my opinion, it's unlikely that they would have believed that she that he would have raised her from the dead because yet none of the apostles had done such thing. They had not there had not been anyone risen from the dead at this point. Uh, there had been no one, the apostles had not read, they had healed those who were sick, and maybe that would indicate that they had heard that he was nearby. They also had heard that he had healed, I'm sure, that because uh, it was near to Joppa, that, that he had healed the man who was sick with palsy and had been bedridden for eight years, and maybe they were, they were in high hopes that if they could get him there, him there in time, that he might be able to heal her sickness, and that Dorcas or Tabitha would be healed. But either way, uh, whatever the case may be, he went. Uh, and it says in, in verse 39, Then Peter rose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chambers, and all the widows stood by weeping and showing the coats and garments in which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, or he put them out, and he knelt down and he prayed. And turning, uh, and, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, when I read that, in any case, she evidently knew who Peter was. Because when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave, 
And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And again, the eternal focus and the global scale of the gospel. It says in the, in the key verse of verse 42, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in Yeshua, or the Master, or Lord. And this healing, and this miraculous healing, it was made known to all people. It was for the strengthening of faith of those who were already followers, and it was to make believers out of those who did not formally believe. We can cross-reference this over. It had been four days. Come forward, was to fall, and everybody was like, oh, yeah. Now, the, the story and the point behind that is, is when someone comes into the faith and they've been quick in the life, they need help shaking off the, the grave clothes because they were dead and they have been risen to life. And it is our responsibility when he turned, he wasn't, I don't believe that Yeshua was speaking to the grave clothes. I believe that Yeshua was speaking to those who were standing around watching and witnessing what had happened. And he turned to them and he said, what are you doing? Loose him and let him go. Help him shake off the shackles of death. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to come alongside our brethren who have come and, and who have been quick into life and we're to help them to know how to walk it out. Help them learn how to walk. Help them to know the way. Now, in verse 43, as we begin to approach into chapter 10, it says, And it came to pass that he, ta that he, tarried, uh, that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner, In chapter 10 is when we're going to begin when I'm talking about the Gentile prophecy. And hopefully all this stuff will come together if you'll follow along with me. I'll try to speak fast if you'll listen fast. And we'll try not to make this all day event. <coughs> chapter 10. And I'm going to begin to do this verse by verse. And just kind of move along as we go. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band uh, called the Italian band. Which means... That He's probably his origin, he come from Italy. But he was a centurion, which means he was the head over a hundred soldiers. Which means he had a hundred men under his authority. It says he was a devout man. First of all, we need to realize he was a Gentile. This man was a Roman. It said he was a devout man, one that feared. Word here in the King James is God or Theos, which we refer to as he feared Yahovah with all his house. And gave much alms to the people and prayed to Yahweh always, always. Verse 3, And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of Yahweh coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Now the ninth hour of the day, which, is, which is, runs alongside and parallels alongside with what was called the ninth hour. Uh, that was a common prayer uh, hour of prayer for the Jews. It would, cor it would correlate along with what we call 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it says, When he looked upon him, uh, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before Yahweh. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them, um, and uh, of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all things unto them, he sent them unto Jaffa. And on the morrow, as they went in their, to their journey, he drew near unto the city. Uh, I'm sorry, let me back up verse 9. And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew near unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. This would correlate with what we would refer to noontime. What happens at noontime? It's bean time. It's dinner time. It's time to eat lunch. Now, how do we know? Look at verse 10. And he became very hungry. 
and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Translated in layman terms, while they were trying to prepare lunch, he was really, really hungry. And while he, he, they were downstairs trying to prepare lunch, he fell into a vision. I want to emphasize the fact, hear me, Peter was very hungry. Okay? Scripture says it. He was very hungry. Verse 11, And he saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as if it had been a great sheet knit or held at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Listen carefully, people. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice unto him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, let's try to put this into perspective for a moment. Number one, Peter's hungry. They're preparing food downstairs. He fell into a trance. He sees a vision where this great big sheet full of all kinds of, I will declare to you, it's clear that they were unclean animals. Lowered down by the four corners, and then you hear a celestial voice from heaven. It goes, Peter, kill and eat. Pretty good indication. What does Peter say? Never eaten anything or unclean. The voice spake unto him again the second time, What Yahweh or Yahweh has cleansed, that call not thou common. It says, This was done thrice or three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now pay attention to verse 17. And now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which, we, which he had seen might mean. In other words, Peter has gone, hmm, what was that about? Now before I move forward, we all know that main that with a lack of better terminology, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, but that Yeshua or Jesus Christ come and died on the cross to set the pig free so that we could eat whatever we wanted to. But I want to declare to you, I want to back back up here just a moment. When he said, kill Peter, kill and eat, in verse 13 and 14, Peter said, no, not so. I want to, I want to go back in time to when Yeshua was with them in Mark chapter 7. And I want to clarify something to you real quick. Now, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of get you into perspective. This is where, um, in Mark 7, this is where um, the Pharisees came up and they, they saw the disciples eating with unwashed hands. <coughs> And they said, why do your disciples do not follow the traditions of elders and they're eating with defiled? Or they're eating with unclean hands. Now i got to remember, when it comes to a rabbi, these men, these twelve disciples, they went everywhere that Yeshua went. They were with Yeshua 24-7 unless He had sent them out to do a task or to do something. It's a very, very, very high likelihood Peter was standing there when this happened. Matter of fact, Peter might have been one of the ones eating with dirty hands. We don't know. But they ask, why are you, why do your, uh, he says in verse, in Mark 7, verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, do not eat, holding to the tradition of the elders. <coughs> well, Verse 4 says, And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, uh, there be in which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and the pots and brazen vessels and of tables. And when the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, Why walk not your disciples according to what? The traditions of the elders, but do eat bread with unwashed hands. First of all, I want to make sure, make, make sure you understand that the conversation here was talking about how one defiles food. This was not a conversation talking about clean and unclean animals. 
This is talking about eating with unwashed hands according to tradition. This is not a conversation about eating clean and unclean food. But Yeshua answered him in verse 6, and he says, And he answered and said unto them, Well, has Isaiah uh, prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Howbeit in vain, listen carefully, howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We need to realize something really quickly, that there's a such thing as vain worship. In vain they worship me. Why? Because they were doing things according to the traditions of men. Doesn't make all tradition bad. But we live in a world today that a mainstream, the mainstream popular belief system will contradict the Word for the sake of their tradition. And they think that Yahweh is pleased by that in some form or fashion. But in my book, which I know you carry, says multiple times that Yahweh does not change. Now, he says in verse 8, For the laying aside of the commandments of God, or Yahuwah, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of, cu of pots and cups and many other such like things that you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of Yahweh, that you may keep your tradition. Hear me out. He said that you forsake the commandment or you reject the commandments, the clear commandments of Yahweh in order to keep your own tradition. Notice what he says in the next verse. He says, for Moses said, first of all, I want to connect a couple dots right there. The law of Moses, what Moses said and the law of Moses and the law of Yahweh are one and the same. Yahweh, uh, Moses never had a law. All Moses did was pass it down. He might have been a mouthpiece, but he was not the author of the law. And he goes on to say uh, that Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whosoever curses his father and mother, let him die the death. But he says, You say if a man shall say to his father and mother, It is Corban, that is a gift, or whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. He's talking about a way that they've kind of finagled their way around and weaseled their way around obeying by trying to bend the rules a little bit. They still do that in Israel where a Jew will sell his place of business on Friday to a Gentile and buy it back on the first day of the week so that he doesn't have to close his business on Sabbath. Hey. Trying to bend the rules to make them fit. A lot of times we refer to, they refer to the Talmud as being uh, fences to protect from breaking the commandments. But a lot of times what they do is they widen the margins of the road to keep you from breaking instead of making fences. Now, I'm going to move forward for the sake of time. He goes on, he talks about how that... Um, um, he finds the verse I want to pick up on. <clears throat> verse 14, and when, he said, and when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. So first thing he's doing, he's saying, you need to understand something. There is nothing... From within a man, that entering in him can defile him, but the thing which comes out of him, those are they that which defile a man. That is not saying you can eat whatever you want to. What he's talking about is, again, the context is eating with unclean hands, not clean and unclean food. Because in their idea that when you touch the bread or the instrument of food, the broma, that which is to be eaten, when you touched it with unclean hands, you therefore defiled the food. Now the food was unclean. And he's saying that's not the way this goes. He said what comes out of a man is what defiles a man. Because he talks about, because out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Remember that? Okay, that's the point here. And he says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he goes on down. 
uh, in verse 18, he says, And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding? Well, let me go to verse 17. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning this parable. They didn't even understand what he was saying. And he said unto them, Are you all so without understanding also? He said, You don't get this either. He says, Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing uh, from without enters into a man, it cannot defile him? Because it enters not into his heart, but into his belly, and goeth out in the drought, purging all meats. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take just a minute here and hear me out. There are people who are doing the very best they can to defend the Torah by using, they'll talk about this passage of Scripture, because if you, this particular verse, verse 19, let me share with you what it, how that reads in the HCSB, just for the sake of, of, making my point in Mark chapter 7 verse 19 this is the way it reads um, for it does not enter into his heart but into his stomach and is eliminated quote unquote parentheses listen to this as a result he made all foods clean do you hear that? There's a parenthesis right here. And this is the HCSB. It says, as a result, he made all foods clean. Now, you'll hear people argue, and they'll go, well, if you look at any Bible that's less than 100 years old, you'll never find that phrase. Making all foods clean. That is a true statement. But the idea is in the context. Let me explain. When he says, because it enters not into his heart, but into his belly, and goeth out into the drought, hear this, purging all meats. That is, that phrase, simply put, is cleansing all food. Simple as that. That's what it means. So the idea, and the parentheses, is put there with the intention of clarity. Am I going to tell you that, there's, that that's never been put in there because of biased opinion and and trying to creep a doctrine in. No, I'm not telling you that. But what I'm saying, the idea of cleansing all meats is found in the Greek text. But let me clarify what it says. He says, purging all meat. Broma, that which is to be eaten. It doesn't say table legs, scorpions, tarantulas, black widow spiders, bats. That's not what it's saying. It's saying broma, cleansing all broma. The intestinal system cleanses. And he said, eating with dirty fingers doesn't defile a man. That does not say eating unclean food. That's not the context. The context is eating with unwashed hands, defiling food, broma. I've often said that if you take a man... He's yet unconscious and you will sustain him to survive and you, and you knock him unconscious and you give him permanent amnesia, you fly him while he's unconscious to a deserted island that has all manners of life to sustain him and you lay a Bible upon his chest with a letter on top of it that said this is your instructions to life and you leave that man alone there for one solid year and you come back and you pick him up and you bring him to America, and you take him to a pork barbecue joint, he won't eat it because he sees in the Word that he's not supposed to. It's not broma. It's not food. The problem is, is our cultural blindness. That's our problem. He, it, the Scripture does say, Yeshua did say, it purges all meat. It cleanses food. There are animals that are intended to be food, and there are animals that are not intended to be food. There are animals intended to be eaten, to provide nourishment, and then there are animals that Yahweh put on this earth to use as a vacuum cleaner. Okay, now, I just wanted to point that out, that don't, don't be found guilty of using that argument that you can't find that declaring all foods clean in a, in a Bible that's less than 100 years old. Don't use that because it's a straw man argument because a good theologian 
who knows his Bible, who knows the Scripture and can and can study and studies Greek and Hebrew, can point out to you that purging all meats means cleansing all food. Now, backing back up into Acts uh, chapter uh, ten. <coughs> I want to point out the fact that going, talking about Mark 7 right there, that if we're going to suppose, which he very, very highly likely was, that Peter was present at Mark, that when that event happened in Mark 7. Now, if Peter had understood Yeshua to say, you can eat whatever you want to now, then why would Peter have said, no, not so? For nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. Now he walked with Yeshua for three and a half years. And if he was standing there that day and he understood Yeshua would say, eat whatever you want to, Peter wouldn't have had an issue. He shouldn't have had an issue. But we got to remember, he didn't tell David Baxter. He didn't tell Beverly. He didn't tell John Swindell no. He told the creator of everything uh, no. Three times. Talk about defiance. That's defiance. He told the, cre he told the Creator of heaven and earth, uh, no. <laughs> he said, don't, don't declare what I... He said, don't, don't call what I've cleansed common or unclean. He said, no. <laughs> Three times. Peter didn't understand what the vision might mean. He said, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen might mean, he was going, what was that about? Now people will use the argument, well, if, if God didn't want him to eat that, he wouldn't, to why did he tell him to eat it if he didn't really intend for him to eat it? My answer to that is, is if Yahweh didn't intend for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, why did he tell him to do it? Yahweh's about object lessons. He was teaching Abraham a lesson. And in the same way, he's teaching Peter one. And we're going to talk about what that is. Now I'm going to read, you guys may not have picked up on it, but back when we were reading, this morning when the, uh, reading Hosea, I think it was James reading Hosea in chapter 2, I want to read to you back up in, in, he, in Acts chapter 10, verse 12. And we'll go till everybody's seat wears out and I'll talk about this however long we need to. If any of you start wearing thin, just raise your hand and we'll call it off and we'll pick this up next week. But I want to make sure I don't rush through this because it's very important. All right? In Acts, or in Acts chapter 10, verse 12, I want you to listen to what it says. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Got that? Ingrain that. Burn that into your mind and hold on to it just for a second. Okay? I'm going to back back up and we're going to talk about Hosea 2. Hosea 2, verse 18. Listen carefully. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. Did you hear that? Let me go back to Acts 10, 12. Wherein all manners of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. I'm going to go back to Hosea 2. And with the beast of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. Did you hear that? Did you hear what just happened right there? Notice what he says. And in that day I'll make a covenant. Hmm. Interesting. Are we dealing with something prophetic here? Now, I'm going to briefly touch, because I can open up a whole can of worms. We're talking about Daniel 9, when we heard Dave read Daniel 9, talking about the coming of the Messiah and the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. We know it's 490 years. He says in verse, in verse 27, talks about he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, many people think that he there is dealing with Antichrist. That first of all, I'll make a point that Antichrist, Satan never made a deal with any, he never made a covenant with anybody. And it didn't say, it says he would confirm the covenant. That word confirm means he will cause it to stand, the covenant 
many for one week, but in the midst of the week, he's cut off. And the reason they say, a lot of mainstream scholars say that can't be Christ or Yeshua is because it was in the middle of the week, he was cut off. That's exactly what the verse says it would do. And in the middle of the week, he's cut off. Confirm the covenant. Remember what Yeshua said? I only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember that? We are for the first time after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, of Yeshua Messiah, for the first time right here with the conversion of Paul, the stoning of Stephen, and with the house of Cornelius. We're here in the God, you know, we have a big milestone event. Well, if Yeshua was the He who would confirm the covenant, but He was cut off in the middle of the week, how would He confirm the covenant if He, if he was dead in the middle of the week? We're looking for a milestone marker. The apostle. Now, they argue about, they get minute. They argue about pinpoint moments in time. But remember, when we're looking this far back, we're looking for, we're trying to hit the target. We're not necessarily trying to hit the what we call in archery tournaments a, a 12 ring. We're not trying to hit the 12 ring target. We're trying to hit the target. By all indications, the conversion of Paul the Apostle, which Yeshua himself said, I've chosen him to be a vessel to who? The children of Israel, the kings, and the Gentiles. Then Peter, this is happening to Peter. Guess when that happened? About three and a half years after the resurrection. Half of a week. This is when the gospel is going forth to the Gentiles. So if Yeshua, if his ministry began the 70th week, ministry is three and a half years long, he's cut off. The gospel stays to the Jew for approximately three and a half years, then it goes to the Gentiles. One week. Just something to think about. Now, <coughs> he says in Acts 10, he says uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 17, Now while Peter doubted himself what this vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So Peter's sitting on the roof. He's going, what in the world is that all about? And at the same time, these men in which Cornelius sent after him come to Simon's gate. How many men were there? Three men. How many times did the vision come down? Three times. Okay. He says, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, he's still sitting up there going, what's this all about? He says, and while Peter thought on the vision, listen, oh, you're always not done yet. He says, and the Spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek you. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to, uh, to the men which were sent from Cornelius and asked, Behold, I am he in whom you seek. What is the cause and wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, the centurion, a just man, one that feareth Yahweh, or God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned by Yahweh, uh, by a holy angel to send for thee in the, into this house or into his house and to hear words of thee. And he called them in and lodged them. First and foremost, we're going to hear in just a moment, that was a no-no. According to Jewish oral law, that didn't happen. Jews did not keep company with Gentiles. Cornelius and the people he sent were Gentiles. Okay? He brought them in, let them spend the night, and it says, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. We later read that there were six men. Six men. Hell, I'm like six. I mean six men. They were Jewish men who went with Peter. Okay? And he says, and on the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited on them, he had called together for his kinsmen and near friends. And Peter 
And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Listen carefully. This Peter done what he was supposed to do. And Peter took him up and said, No, 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 you stand up. I'm yet but a man. You don't, don't fall down at my feet. I'm but a man. And that's another reason why I see Yeshua in the Old Testament appearing multiple times because there were times when the angel of Yahweh appeared and they, built, they knelt down and worshipped, them, worshipped him and he didn't say, get up. There were other times when messenger angels were sent and no, no, stand up. There are also times such as the time when uh, in, in the pronunciation of Samson and the birth of Samson says an angel of the Lord they didn't and when when Abraham met the angel of the Lord in the plains of Mamre he knelt down and worshipped him too and he didn't say get up but he said I'm but a man verse 27 and he talked with him and as he talked with him he went in and found many that were come together Cornelius invited everybody he knew and he said unto him, listen carefully in verse 28, and he said unto him, you know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto a one of another nation or a Gentile, if you will. Now I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. You can't find anywhere in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, you cannot find that it is an unlawful thing to be in the company of a Gentile. This come from the oral law. This law was not from the Torah, but rather from the Jewish oral law. And when he said, you know it's an unlawful thing for me to be here. But listen very carefully. But Yahweh has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The vision I, I'm proposed to you before that this had to do with the prophecy about the gospel going to the Gentiles. Timing for the 70 week prophecy of Daniel and the confirming of the covenant in the latter half of the week. But can we prove it? Back, back up to Hosea 2. I read to you verse 18. says, In the day I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth. Now that's, sim that's symbolic verbiage for saying I'm going to tear down the instruments of war where there will be peace. We hear something kind of like that when, he tore, when Yeshua tore down the middle wall of partition, taking and making one new man, Remember? He says, And the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. Listen to verse 23 in Hosea 2. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Listen carefully. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God or my Elohim. That come from the passage we read earlier from Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, let me share with you where Peter quotes. He quotes Exodus 19, 5 and 6, and he quotes Hosea 2, 23. He says, but you are a chosen generation. This is uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him unto, uh, who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's a quote straight from Exodus 19, 5 and 6. But He said, if you'll obey My commands, then you'll be a peculiar people. You'll be a generation of priests. But he says, but you, he's talking about the scattered ones in, in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. <coughs> These were the believers. He says, you are a chosen generation. He goes on to say, listen to verse 10, which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of 
Yahweh, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's a quote from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, straight off the books. It's specifically being applied to anybody who comes into the faith, regardless of your nationality. He goes in verse 29 in Acts 10, he says, Therefore I came unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked wherefore, uh, wherefore, for what intent you have sent me. Cornelius said four days I was fasting, and I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you, he just goes through the whole thing about what happened to him. I saw I was fasting, I was praying, I saw an angel. He said, sin for you, and I did. Now, look here, he says in verse 33, Immediately therefore I sent thee, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done uh, that thou art come. Now therefore are we are all here present before Yahweh to hear all the things which are commanded of Yahweh or commanded by Yahweh. Listen to verse thirty four. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that Yahweh is no respecter of persons. See, and I'm going to use just like when I was in the way dog we were man and I were in the way documentary. Katie Abaffy stated it so clearly. She said, the mainstream church has really messed this up because this whole thing was clear and true when the... This was a prophecy about the gospel going to the Gentile world and like Katie Abaffy said, the mainstream church is making it about a ham sandwich. There was never anything about this was to change anything about food. This was an object lesson. What the Jewish people knew was unclean, as far as food goes, he used that as a visual picture message to show them what was the Gentiles, the animals on that sheet, they were representation of the Gentiles. That's what it was about. It had nothing to do with food. Never did. Now, we can, uh, we, and I'm going to make a, a couple of more points. I don't even know what time we've got. What are we? Where are we at time? Okay, I'm going to try to wrap this up and we'll pick it up next week. But um, listen very carefully. I'm going to go back to verse 34. He says, When Peter opened, uh, opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that Yahweh is no respecter of persons. What does no respecter of persons mean? means he doesn't elevate one above another based off of race, color, nationality, language, doesn't make a hill of beans. You're all on the same playing field. It's flat as a pancake, and the only way you have hope is Yeshua. That's the only thing. That's not, please don't misunderstand me, that's not anti-Semitism or anything of the such. What that simply states means is outside of Yeshua, you are lost. You are not a chosen people. If you are not a believer and follower of Yeshua, you're outside the family. Don't care what color, nationality, where you were born, your family lineage, I don't care anything about any of that. That's not anti-Semitism. That is simple truth. Biblical truth that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Okay? He says, verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that Yahweh is no respecter of persons. Listen, verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go, for the sake of time, to wrap this up. You know the story. In verses 36, all the way down um, to verse uh, 43, this is the gospel preached. He's preaching about the crucifixion, the rejection and the crucifixion of Yeshua being uh, the Messiah and how that Yahweh rose Him from the dead the third day showing Him openly. He said, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of Yahweh, even unto us who did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. And He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify 
that it, uh, it is he which was ordained by Yahweh to be the judge, uh, to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness. Listen carefully. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. Everybody. Now, verse 44, I'm going to make this word. This is the way it's done. You know, there's people who believe that you have to be baptized in the text in order for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and all this stuff. Right here is absolutely, totally backwards. Peter was simply preaching to them and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they began to speak. They began to speak with tongues and magnify Yahweh. Tongues again doesn't mean incoherent babbling, otherwise they wouldn't have known he was magnifying Yahweh. But he says then, and who knows, when he said he spake in tongues, Cornelius was, was a Gentile. He was a Roman. The tongues he may have spoke might have been Hebrew. We don't know. It does, scripture doesn't say. He may have begin to speak in Hebrew and magnify Yahweh. We don't know. But it says, Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Now, you can go on chapter 11. We'll talk about some more of that next week. Uh, but he says, And he commanded them uh, to be baptized in the name of Yeshua or the Lord. And then prayed they him to tarry certain days or to remain with them. Now, of course, as we go on into chapter 11, we're going to see he goes back, and as soon as he gets back, you got the, you got the haters and the naysayers are going, hey, we're here, and you're like, he recounts the whole thing. We can see these things. They held their peace, and they glorified Yahweh. Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The one, Matthew 24, and they look at Matthew 24 as being prophetic, all this kind of stuff from John Nelson Darby. As I talked, you remember guys a couple weeks ago when we were talking about times, the word Jew is referring to a non circumcision of the heart when he talks about memory and revelation. I talked about how those who claim to be Jew heart, he says, We are the true Jew. To a heathen, one of another nation. That's the case in Luke chapter 21 when he talks about in, in verse 20 he says and when you shall see listen carefully people try to apply this it beats all I've ever seen everything becomes about American prophecy we live in America it drives me crazy but he says in, verse, in Luke 21 verse 20 he says and when you shall see Jerusalem you catch that? Jerusalem compassed or surrounded with armies, he says, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What desolation? The one we refer to as the abomination of desolation coming as spoken by the prophet Daniel. If you don't believe me, read Daniel, then read Matthew 24. It refers to the abomination of desolation as spoken by the prophet Daniel. Okay, he, I don't know how any clear he can get it. He says, let, he, you can hear, let him understand. He's trying to make a point. He says, to them which are in Judea, flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it, uh, let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them which were in the countries there uh, enter in there too. And he says, listen carefully, verse twenty-two: For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Verse twenty-three he talks about woe unto them that are with child, and it gives suck in those days. He says, for there shall be great distress in the land. And, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Fall by the edge of the sword. Jerusalem shall be trodden. It's those of a heathen nation. They shall be trodden down. Who was that heathen nation? The Roman Empire. He says, until the time of the Gentiles or the heathens be fulfilled. This is not the dispensation of the, the Gentile dispensation of grace that everybody's referring to. The phrase Gentiles right here, that trodden down Jerusalem, they're heathens. They're a pagan nation that Yahweh has chosen to pour out wrath upon Jerusalem. Because, why? They rejected Yeshua as Messiah. 
Bottom line, again, that's not anti-Semitism. It's historical, biblical fact. That's not, you know, uh, we want to pray for the nation of Israel, the people there, pray that they would get eyes to see that the scales will be removed from their eyes, that they may be able to see Yeshua. And, and you know what? It's our responsibility to show them Yeshua. What was that? was the whole plan, that we provoke them to jealousy. How? We can't do that by promoting a lawless Messiah. I can tell you that. You talking about something that broke my heart when I was walking in the land of Israel and I figured out when Yahweh showed me that it's my fault they don't believe. What I mean by that is because I present to them a Messiah who cannot be the Messiah that was prophesied by the prophets because I present to them, uh, I present to them a Savior who came and defied His Father and changed His laws. And that, must, that man can't be the Messiah. And I'm the one, when I say I, I mean I, we, you, all of us, we have been guilty at some point of our life of, of presenting that one as the Messiah in which they go, oh, I don't know what you're reading, but I know that ain't him. But I'm thankful for the prophecy that says there'll come a time when we'll say we'll no longer believe the lies of our fathers. And we'll return to the Father's ways. I don't talk about a lot of prophetic stuff, but I'll tell you one thing that does scare the life out of me is what I see is that happening right before the end. And if that's what we've all been able to be a part of by the grace of Yahweh Himself, we're running out of time. Period. We're running out of time. And we better get it done while it's still daytime. Because the nighttime's coming. And there's no more work that we can do. We can't be any more benefit. What we're going to do, we better do now. While we're able. We have to move now while we're able. We can't be shut up and closed up. Confined in our own little houses, cuddled, cuddled up, and you know, there's nobody to fellowship with. We need to seek people. We need to share the truth with people. We need to do it profoundly without fear. I said, Peter is the one who denied him three times. And then after he was unlocked, uh, and I use that phrase metaphorically, after, after his mind was open and he began to realize that all things that, that Yeshua really was, you couldn't shut him up. You couldn't shut Paul up. All of them died a martyr's death, except for John. They tried their best to kill him, and the only reason they didn't succeed is because Yeshua said if they wouldn't. I mean, they tried to kill him. But we need to be those people who are not afraid. And we need to realize that these passages of Scripture that we've been taught our whole life, just like this, this was prophetic. This is huge. What if this is the key? To understanding, you know what it said that in the midst of the week, and he says that desolation is determined of the consummation. Think about those things. Meditate on those things in which we've looked at today, and I'd love to hear any comments or any any reference you have to it. But we'll close for the end of the, for the day because I went a long time today, and I know all these kids are getting hungry, and I'm wearing people out. But I pray you've been able to take something on with you today from a different perspective maybe you haven't seen before. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. I'd love to see what you have. And if you show me things, uh, I just love the script. I don't, it ain't about being right. It's just about knowing the truth. But those are the things that I see plain in Scripture at this point. Let's close in a word of prayer.